Hey, everybody. Welcome back into the Frogs Up TCU Sports Podcast. I am Russ Hodges. That is Anthony North. We are back once again with our midweek episode here Thursday evening, less than 48 hours until the Iron Skillet 2023 battle kicks off at Eamon G. Carter Stadium between TCU and SMU. There's already been a lot of talk on social media. The rivalry renewed once again and maybe for one one of the final times we may see these two teams square off against each other. That and more coming up on this evening's episode. Anthony, how's it hanging? Oh, man, it's it's been a busy week, a uh, busy work week out here, but uh, weather's starting to turn nice. It's, it's good. I'm excited for this Iron Skillet matchup. It feels like, uh, I don't know, there's, there's a weird lack of juice headed into this game. I don't know. Maybe that's just me personally. Maybe I've just been too busy to be paying attention to all the chatter online, but I'm kind of ready in these last few hours leading up to to game day for things to get heated, things to get hated, and, and kind of the, that rivalry really kick off here. But excited to talk about it. How about you, Russ? How's it going? Yeah, we don't have Rasheed Rice and Gary Patterson yeah, yeah. Uh, going around on Twitter talk, talking that smack. It has it has felt like it's been pretty quiet on on that front, but we will see what these two teams do this weekend. We will preview the SMU game, talk about how the Mustangs have gone about their season and what Horn Frog fans should expect from SMU this weekend, we'll also hit on some TCU soccer and TCU volleyball items. Both of those teams were in action earlier this evening, and we will give a little bit of a preview into what's coming up this weekend in the Big 12. So before we get into everything, just a couple of quick uh, plugs here. This episode, of course, is brought to you by our friends at Charlie Hustle Clothing Company. Charlie Hustle, vintage made fresh. Go to charliehustle.com, get your TCU swag, get your Big 12 swag couple of promo codes at your disposal. Use the promo code FROGSOWAR. Get 15% off any TCU items. Or use the promo code 101215, promo code TEN1215 for 15% off any non-sale items. Also, play daily fantasy sports with Prize Picks, the easy way to play daily fantasy. Download the Prize Picks mobile app or go online to prizepicks.com. Use the promo code FROGS12. Get a 100% deposit match up to $100. The Patreon is live. If you would like to donate, support the two of us here on Frogs Up or support the 1012 Network and all of the podcasts involved, go to patreon.com forward slash TEN12 Network. And once again, we brought this up a few days ago. We are partnering with Onnit Athlete, who is launching a TCU football trading card line. Pre-sales are open. TCU, one of roughly 40 other colleges and universities this season that Onnit is working with. Pre-sales are live for the TCU cards. If you want more information, you can find Onnit Athlete online or check out our Frogs of War. Facebook and Twitter, more information is posted there. The packs are launching on October 2nd. Packs are $12.99 each. I want to say there are 14 cards per pack. 33% of all sales go to NIL. So it's for a really good cause if you want to support the TC Horn Frogs, support the football program, support the university, and get some cool merchandise. So check it out on it, athlete. We're really excited about that partnership moving forward. So with all of that, let's go ahead and dive right into this. TCU-SMU, the rivalry renewed, the battle for the iron skill at 2023, one of the final times that these two teams may meet up in what is currently a non-conference game, could be a potential power matchup in the future if these two teams decide to re-up after 2025. I know we've talked on the podcast about the quote-unquote pause of this rivalry game, but it will be renewed this weekend. 11 a.m. Amon G. Carter Stadium. Come out, support the Frogs, wear your purple. Two teams that are 2-1 and one on the season, looking to get to 3-1. and one. SMU's results so far, a 38-24 win against Louisiana Tech, a 69-0 blowout of Prairie View, which is an FCS opponent, I believe. And then Mustangs' only loss coming against Oklahoma in a game where SMU was actually hanging around in the first half. This was a, a close game, a low-scoring game. And 
SMU's defense has looked pretty strong over these first three games. So Anthony, looking at SMU, what are your overall thoughts on this version of the Mustangs? And from what you've seen over these first few games, what's stuck out to you about them? Well, I think the most impressive thing from that Oklahoma game is how they were able to hold down Dylan Gabriel. I mean, the, he had been and, and has continued to really sling it around and you know, amass huge numbers of yards. And then against SMU, he only had 176 yards for the game. He did find four touchdowns. So, you know, that's kind of what we've been talking about with TCU's offense is, hey, we're getting all these yards, but we're not finding the end zone. Um, Oklahoma's offense kind of did the opposite against SMU, where they really weren't moving the ball a whole lot, but were able to uh, to get the ball in the end zone. So, I, you know, I think this SMU defense is much improved from where it's been in all the previous iterations of of this contest. I mean, you know, uh, oftentimes we'll see the TCU SMU game is kind of seen as it will either be a big shootout or it will be TCU kind of gives a a blowout win. And I don't think that's what's going to happen here. I think there's going to be more of a defensive battle in this one than uh, one might expect from from these two that are, have been, you know, kind of run and shoot type teams in the past. Uh, that's that's been the most impressive thing I think. But their their offense has been good as well. It's hard to take too much away from uh, the 69 points against Prairie View, but Preston Stone has been impressive. I think he's continues to be everything that he's been billed to be there at quarterback. Um, and he's distributing the ball uh, across a lot of receivers, but those receivers, it's not picking up a lot of yards. Um, looking at their stats for the season, their four top receivers um, combined have fewer yards than the four receivers had for Colorado against TCU in one game. So that's, you know, I, they're, those receivers, including, of course, Jordan Hudson, who transferred from the Horn Frogs across town to to SMU, uh, nobody's really breaking out as the as you know somebody who's Rasheed Rice or you know the the long list of SMU receivers who have come through there and and been big stars. Um, Jake Bailey has come out and and led the way so far out of the slot. Uh, which is interesting because I think that'll be a pretty good way for them to attack the TCU defense, and we can get into to the that in a bit. But um, you know, I think they they've been balanced on offense more so. You know, it's not a just throwing the ball all over the place. So I I think this SMU team is is really strong. Um, it's it's probably Sonny Dykes has said in the media availability that it's the best team that SMU has had in in a long long time, and. Um, you certainly see it on the field that that game against Oklahoma, an Oklahoma team who is going to be competing at the top of the Big 12 and nationally uh, for them to hang tight like that on the road in Norman. Um, certainly they will expect to hang tight in AMG Carter on Saturday as well. Yeah, I have to believe that this is going to be a close game. It's going to be a competitive game. Anytime you have these rivalry type games, I feel that anything that was done beforehand in terms of what what a team's record is coming in how many points they won by in their last game how many points they lost by none of that matters in, in a rivalry game we've seen some crazy things happen whether it's been against SMU or against Baylor or against Texas Tech there are things that could happen in this game that we don't expect and we talked about in our uh, round table which is going to be coming out tomorrow when we gave our predictions as a staff I think a lot of us predicted high scoring outcomes of this game, but it'll be interesting to see how these defenses fare because on one hand you have TCU who has not allowed a offensive touchdown over each of the last two games. Granted, one of those was Nickel State, but TCU played very well against Houston, holding that rushing offense to only 41 yards and holding Donovan Smith to under 50% completions. And an SMU defense, as you said, Anthony, that played really well against Oklahoma and uh, overall has played some pretty good football this year. So uh, we will see if those defenses come to play once again. But on the offensive end, this this game in particular over the last several years, I feel, has 
always wound up being kind of a shootout. Last season, you have TCU winning 42 to 34. I think about the game a few years ago when it was, I think, 56 to 36. There have been some 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 shootouts in this rivalry over the last few years. And you look at this rivalry since the dawn of this millennium, TCU has really dominated, but you, you shrink that down to the last three or four years, it's been a pretty even contest between these two teams. So this is not going to be a cakewalk by any stretch. SMU is building a lot of momentum both on and off the field with the Mustangs joining the ACC and trying to get that bankroll up and become more competitive in recruiting. You know, we'll see if that ultimately happens, but um, Anthony, in this game, what are some of the things that you're, you're looking out for and you know, how could TCU potentially let this game slip away from, from SMU? You know, I, I don't think this is quite like the Colorado game where everything kind of has to go wrong and you have to make all the big mistakes and you have to um, see the superhuman performances from the opponent to, to lose the game. I think that um, if this game is just played even, that the results are going to be somewhere 60-40, 50-50. Um, you know, I, I think these teams are a lot more evenly matched and this is not a case of, well, you know, as long as Chandler Morris goes out there and manages the game and doesn't throw two red zone interceptions and we don't miss field goals and all of that and, you know, accumulate a ton of penalties, then you easily walk away with a win. I don't think that's the case here. I think TCU is going to have to make stuff happen in this game. Um, and, you know, I, I think the way that they lose it is the things that we've talked about, about just not finding their way into the end zone. Um, you know, if the way that these games that TCU has been able to kind of just play around when they get inside that scoring zone, um, things can get a little bit hairy. And I think, you know, I think TCU could put this one away early. Yeah, I think TCU has the opportunity to go out and and bully around in a couple of ways. Um, but I think that Chandler Morris will be hassled in the backfield a lot in this game, more than he has thus far this season. Um, and whether some some game planning to have, you know, tight ends in there to block or running backs in there to block or scheming things up to get the ball out of his hands really fast um, or get him on the move with some misdirection, I think will be key because um, this SMU defensive front is, at this point, this SMU defense as a whole is the best that TCU will have seen outside of Travis Hunter being superhuman. Um, so I think TCU being able to kind of work their way through that um, and execute past that uh, that higher level of skill will be will be key on Saturday. Yeah, I think about the game last season where TCU got off to a a pretty strong start and was controlling the game throughout, but sort of let SMU hang around, especially in the second half where the Mustangs were able to score a few touchdowns and brought it within a within a one score game, I believe. And then it was, I, I think it was DeMarcado who had the big run through the middle mm -hmm. scored on the long touchdown. And that was the, the walk off when all the, the fans started to, to head for head for their vehicles and, and get out of there. But um, last weekend when TCU played Houston, I felt similar in, in the sense that TCU took control of the game early on and was kind of letting Houston hang around now, ultimately, the Cougars were not able to come back, and that offense just didn't have many answers for the, the pressure that TCU was bringing. Uh, Donovan Smith was struggling to find some throws. Evidently, he was playing with an oblique injury, but nevertheless, Houston was not able to come back, and I think you give TCU's defense a lot of credit. But I would like to see TCU come out in this game and not only take control early on, but really put their foot down on on the throat of the Mustangs and offensively, I think in order to do that, 
as we've discussed multiple times on the podcast, it, TCU feels like they get in their own way sometimes. I feel like watching this offense, the only thing stopping the frogs are the frogs themselves, whether it's via penalties or red zone turnovers or just bad play calling. It's been frustrating at times to see TCU pick up massive chunks of yards and then just get stalled in, in the scoring zone, as you mentioned. And 500 plus yards against Houston, 500 plus yards against Colorado. But settling for five field goal attempts last week, you can't settle for that many field goals. I mean, I would love to see TCU execute better closer to the end zone and continue to clean up some of those self-inflicted wounds, you know, the penalties and some of the turnovers. Hopefully we see a little bit better play calling. I thought TCU showed good balance over the last couple of weeks between run and pass. Amani Bailey has run the ball really well, and he's shown that he's capable of uh, carrying a higher workload. He had 23 carries last week and, and Trey Sanders had eight carries as well. So TC was really efficient on the ground and I'd like to continue to see that balance this weekend on offense. And then defensively, I think we saw TCU begin to find a little more success with the pass rush. Six sacks, Paul Oyewale, redshirt freshman D lineman had two sacks. Johnny Hodges got there for a sack. I'd like to see that continue this weekend because I don't think the Frogs are really going to have much issue with containing SMU's run game, but you can't give Preston Stone all the time in the world to make throws because he's a good enough player. I think he's a better passer than Donovan Smith. You could argue he's a better player than Donovan Smith, and he's too talented to give him a clean pocket and give him all the time in the world to make throws. So offensively, just continue to clean up some of those mistakes from previous games, and then defensively, find a little bit more of a pass rush and put pressure on Preston Stone. I think if TCU can do those two things, the Frogs are going to win this game pretty handily. Yeah, and one thing that's been a trouble this season that TCU uh, suffered from in the game in Dallas against SMU last season was the end of half, beginning of half, kind of middle four minutes there around halftime. Um, TCU this season has given up a field goal right before halftime in each game uh, in the last couple minutes before half and has not been able to score. And then you give the ball back to the opponent right after halftime. So it, in the game against SMU last year, TCU was, like you said, running away with that game, dominating that game. But then Rasheed Rice gets a touchdown where he throws Travis Hodges Tomlinson to the ground and it's not called. They give him the touchdown. They cut it. They cut the lead to two touchdowns, but then they get the ball right, uh, you know, and score again in the third quarter. And then you've got a ball game. Then you've got a one score game and and it's on until that demarcado run. So that's the you can't let them hang around and part of that is managing those key time situations um and and i think that's a it's a tough coaching thing to be paying attention to all the other stuff that's going on and trying to to manage those key timing situations obviously um sunny dykes and and tcu have managed those quite well as well particularly when on offense um you know, I think obviously the the game in Waco last year and all of that, but um, you know, setting up uh, Griffin Kell for a sixty one yard field goal at the end of half last week was not that that wasn't a, a recipe for success at the end of half. I think TCU gets a little bit conservative there when you know we're uh, this Kendall Bryles offense is running a we're, we want to run plays constantly and we're, we're getting up and running plays and running plays and running plays. And then we get in the last two minutes and it's, we're going to slow play this and then not attack. I'd like to see TCU attack in those um, situations, but also really that's, that's the time where the defense needs to stand tall and ensure that, you know, you're, you're not giving up a score and the ball uh, right there in those, those key time moments. Um, yeah, I, th I think 
there's certainly a version of this game that comes out with TCU in a totally dominant fashion. Um, I think TCU is is in a highly motivated spot. And I think SMU, frankly, is in a less motivated spot than it ever has been. SMU's flying high right now. It, you know, they're they're counting their money. They're looking forward to their next season already, playing in the big boy conference. Um, you know, and good for them. Uh, congratulations, you uh, raised commitments for a hundred million dollars. That's that's good. That's something that TCU did like 20 years ago. Um, you know, I, I think the things that they are very, very excited about right now, that's, that's great. That's exciting things for them. But, um, I, you know, I, I think that if that affects anything on the field, it may be, maybe that's where the lack of fire is in this, this rival. We we're just not hearing any of that, like uh, that extreme little brother thing of like, uh, we're we got to come and show you that I don't feel like there there's that that fire at least from the fan base. I don't know. I, I'm sure obviously that the, the players and the coaches they all want to win. Uh, Rhett Lashley's talking big game. Um, he, he's he's really feeling himself. But uh, it, yeah, I I don't know. I think I think that TCU should come out and win this game. But if you let things sit around and it's the same, it's the same thing we said about Houston. It's the same thing we said about Colorado. If you don't put the nail in the coffin and particularly in a rivalry game like this, um, things can, it, it can get out of hand. And, and so, yeah, I agree with you totally that TCU needs to go in there and really uh, stomp on them to, to ensure that that, uh, that cockroach is really dead. Yeah, the the burner accounts have been pretty active, I think, on Twitter between TCU and SMU. I think that's where most of the trash talk has been. But I'll ask you this, Anthony, about the the rivalry and just the current state of things, because as we know, TCU and SMU have paused the game, and there's been you know questions about you know, who who initiated it and does this game need to continue to be played? And I think TCU fans have. Uh, some conflicting opinions and SMU fans are most notably not happy about it. And you know, SMU fans can, can say what they will, but as far as this rivalry goes, and I've talked about it on the podcast dating back to last year, I think my views on it changed as the year progressed, especially with how 2022 went. And as the year progressed, TCU continued to win games and expectations continued to grow. And, you get further and further up that top 25 ladder and you're in a position to compete for a new year's six bowl or a playoff spot and everything falls under the microscope. And I just, I think it's unfortunate what's happening in college football right now with a lot of these regional rivalries going away. You're looking at, I mean, across the country, Washington, Washington state, Oregon, Oregon state, the bedlam game, but I, I understand why TCU is doing this. I agree with Sonny Dykes and I agree with JD that TCU wants more home games on the schedule and playing at Dallas in that tiny little venue just doesn't really do a whole lot for, for TCU. SMU has so much to gain, I think, from this game, whereas TCU just doesn't really gain much from it. now. Could that change in the distant future or the not too distant future with SMU going to the ACC? And could they invest all of the money that they supposedly have into renovating the stadium and building it up and making it a more appealing venue for major opponents to want to come in? Um, to me, that's not out of the question at all. I think there's definitely a, a world years down the road from now where that could be the case, but for now, I think my opinion is that it's it's unfortunate that the rivalry game is going away, but I think in the long haul, it's probably in the best interest of TCU, and I think it's an opportunity to put a, a stronger opponent on the schedule. And I know we've talked about the, the Arkansas State game that was scheduled for 2026 and the backlash that that drew from SMU fans, and 
we, we still don't know what's to come for that schedule because there's still a, a non-conference slot that may be open if the Big 12 sticks with, with nine games. But, Anthony, what are your thoughts on just where this rivalry, I guess, stands right now and where it could potentially go in the near or in the distant future, depending on how things shake out, how the dominoes all fall? Yeah, and and you said it, it canceling or pausing, uh, taking a, a little break in this rivalry as a an annual home and home uh, contest that benefits TCU. But I, as I, I wrote in a Hot Take Tuesday a few weeks ago about, I think it benefits SMU as well. I mean, I think for SMU going into the new conference they can now use that game as well to schedule a home game against somebody else. Um, It doesn't have to be this Super Bowl situation where, you know, it, it, it determines whether your season is good or not. Um, You know, it can just be another game in the course of having a good season, which I think SMU certainly can be capable of having good successful seasons even as they join the ACC i mean the ACC they you know probably even today SMU is a middle top upper middle piece of the ACC if they were in the, there this season so you know i think i think the pause is perfectly fine on both sides i think SMU is playing a little bit of victim here but i think secretly they're all high-fiving each other about uh, about this as well um about the future of it, you know, I think there's, I, I'm a little bit skeptical, but there is a case that someday SMU and TCU can be like Florida State and Florida or Clemson and South Carolina. Um, you know, these non-conference, power conference teams that schedule annual games against each other um, and home and home games against each other. And so I think that it could get to that place, but right now the, the disparity is such that that, that doesn't make sense. I think that if SMU finds the war chest that it's been hiding for 30 years, uh, nearly 40 years, um, and decides to actually play in a, you know, a division one football field and actually, you know, upgrade its facilities and upgrade its, its on-field play. It, it certainly can compete in the NIL market. It can compete in the coaching market. It can compete in the facilities market. It has not for several decades. Uh, obviously, and I nil they competed pretty pretty well back in uh, back in the eighties before you could do such a thing. But you know, I think that will these big money boosters stick around to actually see this out and, and execute on this plan? I think that um, you know TCU had to take a similar road. Uh, if a much longer winding road of spending the money, raising the money, and building the program to a place that it is today. And SMU can do that, but it has not yet done that. And when it does, I think that certainly it it could make sense to to bring uh, an annual home and home back. I don't think it makes sense to you know, play every year at the Cotton Bowl or play every year at Jerry's World in Arlington or or something like that. I don't think that really makes sense um, because, you know, frankly, these are relatively small fan bases on the on the scale of things. And um, the as a rivalry, it's much more fun to have these games as on campus games. So, I, you know, does SMU get there? Sure. And and, you know, all of this is to say this is. This is not even about like this football game on Saturday. This is about just the general where the athletic departments sit today. I don't think anyone who is an SMU fan would say that the athletic departments, you know, TCU will be at the top of the Big 12 in 
spending in revenue uh and and all of the financials going forward at the at, they will be number 1 in all of the numbers of the Big 12 um you know to suggest that SMU will immediately step into the ACC and be at the top of the spending and revenue numbers it's it's not realistic could they win this game saturday absolutely it, it is a it is should be a hotly contested game but the question about where does the rivalry stand we know where the rivalry stands and and SMU fans who suggest otherwise are are just kidding themselves well, with that, let's go ahead and get into our predictions here as we wrap up this this topic. And my prediction will be TCU coming out with a win, of course. I've never picked against the Frogs here on Frogs of War or the podcast. I will continue to always pick TCU. But I think much like previous years in recent history, this will be a relatively high-scoring game. I think TCU is going to continue to build on its recent offensive performances. I think the Frogs are going to clean things up, and I'm not surprised that SMU will come in and I won't be surprised to see SMU come in and score a little bit, particularly in the second half. But I picked TCU to win 48 to 24 was my final score. I think the Frogs come out early like they did last year and control the game. I think in the second half, they'll continue to find that rhythm offensively and I think SMU will be able to get into the end zone a couple times, but I don't think it's really going to matter. Uh, TCU is going to come away with the win. 48 to 24 is my final score. Yeah, I have it a, a lower scoring, more of a rock fight between these two on Saturday. I've got it 31-21 to the Horn Frogs, a 10-point victory that is very much in doubt into the fourth quarter uh, with, with maybe TCU making a field goal late in the fourth quarter to extend that. Uh, that's one score lead to a 10 point lead um, and end up getting a, you know, getting a stop on a fourth down after that and running the clock out. So I, th I think it'll be a, a very close game through much of this one where there is some sloppiness. There is some chippiness. Um, I, th I think that uh, th there will be some of that, you know, that rivalry fury, um, I'm sure that Jordan Hudson would love to grab a big Dallas flag and run to the middle of Amon G. Carter Stadium and plant it there. Um, and I think that his teammates are going to do everything to make sure that that happens. And I think TCU uh, will be highly motivated to prevent him from doing so. So, um, yeah, I think I think the TCU defense has a successful day. I am optimistic about their performance in this one. I think that, uh, you know, they've it, it's hard because Houston might be the worst team in the Big 12 and Nichols is an FCS team. So did they fix anything or was it a, a competition disparity? But I think TC will come out and, and be able to slow Preston Stone and, and – you know, yes, their their running backs are probably not as highly thought of now um, as Preston Stone in the passing offenses, but certainly SMU has some runners that are were highly touted recruits, big time. You know, four or five star recruits uh, transfer in from A and M and from Miami, so uh, certainly capable of getting things done out of the backfield, whether on run plays or swing plays, and we've seen that kill the frogs in the past but i'm going with a low scoring game well under the total and, and tcu covers the spread and we get a we get a horn frog victory by 10 points and tcu currently 1-0 in the big 12 sitting alone atop the big 12 standings as there was only one Stop conference game played last weekend of course that was <laughs> tcu in houston this weekend however tcu in houston the only Big 12 teams that are not playing in conference, Houston is playing against Sam Houston State at home in what should theoretically be a, a tune-up game, but we will see there given how Houston has looked so far this year. But taking a look at some of the scheduled games in the Big 12 this weekend, Oklahoma goes on the road against Cincinnati. That'll be a 11 a.m. kickoff. 
Texas Tech going to West Virginia and BYU taking on Kansas. Both of those teams are 3-0 and to start the year. That's a 2-30 kickoff on ESPN. A abomination of a football game likely to ensue <laughs> at uh, 3 o'clock on FS1 oh, as man. Oklahoma Poor State guys. goes to Iowa State. We did our weekly Frogs of War staff pick them, and I decided not to choose a winner of this game because I think we all lose. We, we all lose as fans if we're watching this one. I abstain. So uh, that'll be going on. And then into the night games, we have Texas going on the road against Baylor and then UCF, who is also 3-0, and taking on Kansas State. I think that'll be one of the more exciting games in the Big 12 this weekend. UCF uh, has already gone on the road, I believe, and beat Boise State in a, in a close-scoring game. And Kansas State just got upset by Missouri on a 61 yard field goal. So Anthony, any thoughts on the big 12 action this weekend? Any games that you have your eye on? Yeah, I love that late night game. Yeah. UCF with the walk-off in Boise, Kansas state suffering the walk-off in, in Missouri. That's, I I think this one lost a little bit of juice with the quarterbacks, potentially both out. Um, Will Howard for Kansas state is day to day. Um, questionable and John Rice Plumley for UCF is uh, had already been announced previously as out for two to three weeks. So I think he's already certain to miss this one. Um, so it's unfortunate there. You're not getting these teams at, at full strength, but I think it would have been a pretty cool measuring stick game there for, for UCF in its first game in the conference to take on the conference champions, the reigning conference champions to go up there at their place. Um, and and they could still they could still go do it. They could still go take that game. But I think if if these teams were at full strength, it would have been a little more fun. But still a pretty exciting one. I'm I'm interested to see what uh, Nippert Stadium in Cincinnati is going to look like with Oklahoma coming to town. Big noon Saturday coming to town. First game in the Big Twelve. Um, I you know I hope that they do a better job showing up than Houston did. Um, you know I know we talked last week about the weather and. Uh, kind of the circumstances coming off the loss to Rice. Uh, obviously, Cincinnati's coming off a bad loss here to to Miami, Ohio. So I, I hope Cincinnati shows out there um, and you know gives Oklahoma a good run for its money. I think Oklahoma probably walks away with the game relatively easily at the end, but um, I, I kind of hope it's an exciting game. That one's going on at the same time as the TCU game, though, so probably we won't be watching too much of that i guess unless you're at home you know clicking back and forth but um yeah i think the the BYU Kansas game i'm i'm interested in this game because i was pretty low on both of these teams coming into the season i thought i thought Kansas would probably take a little step back i didn't think highly at all of BYU i thought they were pretty bad i thought they were pretty poorly coached and they'd lost a bunch of their guys. I mean, Puka Nuku is going off in the NFL right now. Um, you know, so I kind of felt down on them and then they go and beat Arkansas at Arkansas and they're both sitting three and O with a chance to, to, uh, get a win here in the conference. I think that'll be a really interesting game. Kansas is a big favorite, but you know, BYU coming off of that, that game in Arkansas, why couldn't they also go into Lawrence and go steal a game from Jalen Daniels and, and the boys up there? So uh, pretty interesting stuff. And I guess the Texas Tech West Virginia game has some juice too. I think, you know, Texas Tech is kind of floundering and teetering on the edge of insanity. I think, you know, if, if they drop a third game here, I, I, things are going to get kind of sticky out there in Lubbock. It, not, not hot seat or anything like that, but just, a uh, really disappointing start to the season for them. Huge, huge hopes for them on the season. And if they were to lose a game to West Virginia in conference, it really puts their their chances to go and and earn a spot to the Big Twelve Championship on on life support uh, with the the challenges that lie ahead for them. Uh, so that's that is a huge game. Really, a lot of anxiety, I think, in that game. Certainly. West Virginia, maybe Neil Brown saved his job a little bit. They're they're sitting, got a couple wins that they probably didn't think they would get. So there's he, he's maybe feeling a little bit better, but uh, 
pretty interesting games across no like super games none of that like big ranked on ranked no you know we we don't have like the top contenders maybe playing against each other unless uh you think central florida is really uh, at the top of the list which which they've played lights out so far so maybe so um but i think a lot of intriguing games across the conference and of course, nationally, we're going to have a huge game as well between Notre Dame and Ohio State, a, a top 10 matchup there. Uh, I, I believe all of us picked Notre Dame. I think maybe one of us on staff picked Anthony. That's me. You picked Ohio State. Okay. That's me. Everybody I took the else, Buckeyes. I think, picked ND. So I, I think you, you might have the odds in your favor. It might be like on, on ESPN on uh, College Game Day when everybody picks yeah. one team and then you have one guy who defies the rest of the group and picks that that other team and that other team winds up winning the game and i picked nd just because i think the quarterback situation for the iris sam hartman is a stud he's legit he's a guy who i could see stepping into an nfl role next year and then playing right away he's very accurate with the football he was very good at wake forest he's Mm -hmm. had a very productive career and Ohio State has some questions at the quarterback spot, much like Alabama does. So both of those two teams are still, I think, trying to figure out who that guy is and who is going to be that guy for the rest of the season. So um, I got ND there. We will see how that plays out this weekend. Anthony, any final thoughts here on anything football related before we hit our TCU soccer and volleyball items and transition out of here? No, let's let's move on. Let's close it. Next All right, thing. sounds good. So TCU Soccer had a match earlier this evening going on the road and defeating Cincinnati 1-0. to zero. So the first Big 12 win of the season for TCU Soccer, who had previously gone on the road and drew the number one ranked team in the country, BYU, 3-3. Three to three. TCU winning today 1-0, to zero, a scoreless game going into the second half. Really physical Cincinnati team that drew four yellow cards in the second half, one of which uh, resulted in a penalty kick for AJ Hennessy, who scored and put TCU ahead one to zero and the Frogs ultimately win the game. Lauren Kellett had two saves for the shutout. So TCU now five, three and two on the season. The Frogs will continue big 12 play against West Virginia on the road Sunday and TCU volleyball tipping off the big 12 schedule tonight sweeping Kansas State on the road in three sets, looking very impressive. TCU has now won six consecutive games, and they'll look to sweep the Wildcats tomorrow. Um, Riley Buckley had 19 assists, Melanie Parra with 14 kills, and then Brianna Green with 10 blocks, another double-digit block performance for her, which 10 blocks in a three-set match is really impressive. And TCU was able to get some of their uh, rotational players involved and all around a really good performance for, for TCU. So the frogs continuing to gain a lot of steam on the volleyball court and on the soccer field. Anthony, I'm not sure if you caught much of the Cincinnati game, but any thoughts on what you've seen from soccer or volleyball? Yeah, for, for soccer, you know, I think this, the way this schedule shook out was pretty difficult for the frogs here where they go on a, a long road trip. They go, uh, two road games in the non-conference um, in Indiana against Purdue and Butler. And then they have to travel to Provo for the top ranked uh, BYU Cougars. They get one little reprieve back at home uh, against SFA, but then right back on the road at Cincinnati at West Virginia for the big 12 kind of East coast tour. And that's, that's a really tough, you know, not to mention that, competition is difficult but just the the strain to to have to go on the road that much uh week after week so i think you know that it's just the way the the schedule shook out for them but uh, really impressive to go to cincinnati after all of that travel go earn this win and then you know get ready for for a, uh, a west virginia team that has given tcu fits in the past so Um, really strong goalkeeping, really physical, uh, defensive minded team there in Morgantown. So certainly a challenge coming up this weekend for TCU, but very good to, to get the win, even if it, it comes from a PK and not from the run of play. 
And again, TCU soccer, five, three, and two on the season. Now volleyball, eight and four. Also men's tennis and some of the other programs are getting their fall seasons kicked off. If you want to read more and learn more about what's going on with those programs, follow us online at www.frogsawar.com. Continue to follow us on social media, Facebook and Twitter at Frogs Awar. Charlie Hustle Clothing, get your TCU swag online, charliehustle.com. Again, promo code Frogs O War, 15% off all TCU items, or the promo code 101215TEN1215 for 15% off any non sale items. If you're into daily fantasy, play prize picks online or through the prize picks mobile app. Use the promo code Frogs12, 100% deposit match up to $100. The Patreon support. The two of us on Frogs Up support the 1012 Network. Go to patreon.com forward slash TEN 12 Network. Support all of us. All the podcasts involved with 1012 Network do a great job. So it would mean a lot. And then lastly, on it, Athlete, again, pre-sales have launched for TCU football trading cards. Check out our uh, Facebook and Twitter. We have information posted about that. As well, that will do it for our midweek episode this evening. We will be back recording Sunday night to recap the SMU game and talk more about what is coming up and the other latest and greatest things in TCU sports. With that, we will sign off for the evening. I am Russ Hodges. That is Anthony North, and we will leave you all with the frogs up. Get your frogs up.